Welcome to episode number 13 of the Cheese Steaks and Controllers podcast for Fox PHL The Gambler, 102.5 FM Philadelphia, also 1480 AM Philadelphia, and iHeart Radio. My name is Jason Finelli, and I am the esports and gaming insider for Fox PHL The Gambler, and we have an um, interesting Interesting episode for you this evening. Um, something that I ranted about last episode has already been halfway uh, taken care of. So somebody was listening to this podcast. Thank you to whoever that leaker was. We'll get into that. I'm also going to breach a topic that I have not really breached on this podcast before. Uh, specifically, a major section of the esports world that um, has really gone relatively unknown uh, for me and for Sean uh, when I go on the radio with him uh, weekly. This is not something we normally talk about. I'd really like to get into it, uh, to dig into it a little bit for you this evening because they're they're about to ramp up. They're about to start their end game, their their postseason, and it's time to talk about them. But um, before we get into that, let's talk about the six in 60 seconds. First off, the Overwatch League playoffs took place all last weekend, and your Philadelphia Fusion won both of their matches three games to zero, and they face San Francisco Shock Saturday, of course they do, for a berth in the Grand Finals. Elsewhere, Team Solo Mid and FlyQuest both qualified for League of Legends World 2020 main event, and Team Liquid qualified for the play-in. Also, Call of Duty League's Minnesota Rocker dropped all of their players in the last week, with the new league year starting on September the 14th. Meanwhile, the Xbox Series X and S have been detailed. $4.99 for the X, $2.99 for the S, both on November 10th. We'll get into more of that later. Nintendo also revealed Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity, set in the Breath of the Wild universe and taking place 100 years before the events of that game. Finally, Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, the next installment of the Call of Duty franchise, had its multiplayer offerings detailed earlier this week with things like Deniable Operations and other new modes. Open beta for the multiplayer starts in October. That was your 6 in 60 seconds. Yes, there you are. That is your 6 in 60 seconds. Fusion Killing it in the Overwatch League last weekend. Hopefully they can do the same this weekend. Beat the Shock and make it to the Grand Finals. One win and they're in. That's all it's going to take. One win and they are in. But right now I want to talk about a different eSport. I want to talk about an eSport that we have not really gotten into here on the Cheese Steaks and Controllers podcast. And now that they are entering their playoffs, um, I think it's time that we talk about League of Legends, perhaps the most successful and popular esport in the world. We're talking the FIFA of esports here. Riot Games has been making League of Legends for over 10 years now. Their 10-year celebration was actually last year at their Worlds event. Um, And they're coming up this Tuesday, the 15th uh, of September is their group draw, which is exactly as the World Cup does it. Teams qualify for the League of Legends World Championships from different leagues across the world. You have League Championship Series, or LCS, here in America. You have LEC in Europe, LCK in Korea, LPL, I believe is the Chinese League, and others. 24 teams from across the world have qualified for the World Championships. 
12 of those 24 teams qualified by winning the summer or spring tournaments in their respective leagues. For example, in North America, Team Solo Mid won the summer championship. FlyQuest was the runner-up, so they both qualify from the North American region. Meanwhile, Team Liquid, for placing in third place, is in the play-in stage. Now, you've already seen that there is a bit of a difference between Overwatch and Call of Duty and League of Legends. I'm naming these teams, Team Liquid and Team Solo Mid and FlyQuest, and when we start talking about Korea, we'll talk about Gen G. and when we start talking about Europe, we'll talk about Fnatic and Rogue and G2 Esports, and you're probably thinking to yourself, who are these teams? Now, these are esports teams or esports organizations. They have been long standing in the esports industry, and they represent themselves in the League of Legends tournament. FaZe Clan, a good example that won't be included in the League of Legends talk, is an esports brand or an esports company um, that happened to purchase a franchise. In Call of Duty League, that's why they're called Atlanta Phase. All the Overwatch teams are run or are are purchased and run by uh, teams like this. Luminosity Gaming in Seattle, for example, owns both the Vancouver Titans of the Overwatch League and the Seattle Surge of the Call of Duty League. It's just that those two leagues choose to use a city-based format as opposed to League of Legends, where the brands represent themselves. So I'm going to be saying a lot of weird names here. Um, Just try and follow along with me. Uh, They are not city-based, so you kind of have to focus a little bit uh, on the brands. But for the most part, it's not that difficult to wrap your head around um, when you realize what's really going on. So the way that League of Legends, first of all, let's talk about what is League of Legends. League of Legends is a 5 versus 5 multiplayer game in what is called the Multiplayer Online Battle Arena format. And how that works is there's a standard map that all teams and all players play on, whether you're professional or it's your first ever match. The map is always the same. It never changes. It is symmetrical. It has two main points on either end called the Nexus, one for one team, one for the other. Then there are three lanes that connect those nexus, top lane, middle lane, and bottom lane, or bot lane. And then in the middle of those lanes, in between top and mid, or mid and bot, are what's called the jungle. Each game consists of five players versus five players, and the objective is to destroy points in the lanes, so that you can reach the opponent's nexus and destroy it. The first team to destroy the other team's nexus wins the game. That's the basic goal, but there are other things that you need to do in order to get there. For example, while there are five players versus five players, also on the board or in the level are what are called minions. These are little, non-controllable characters that players can attack and kill for more resources. Um, As you gather resources throughout the match, you can power up your champion, uh, give them new abilities, give them access to new abilities, uh, and things like that. Um, Inside the jungle, there are special creatures that appear that that if they are killed, can be mined for resources as well. In fact, one of the player's jobs is specifically to go through the jungle and find enemies to kill. Um... So that's the basic game. It's 5 on 5. It's very tactical, very easy to watch. Uh, and the easier it gets easier to watch as you learn the rules and mechanics of the game. Um, it's top down view, so you don't have to worry about first person or over the shoulder like Overwatch League or Call of Duty League. Um, the, the official League of Legends Twitch stream does a great job of putting all the information you need on the screen at once. Uh, So you can tell who's killed more minions, who has more resources, who's gotten further along in the map, 
who's winning, basically. Very easy to tell. Um, an easier watch uh, in most regards than Overwatch League, I would say. And uh, it's a very entertaining game uh, to be to uh, take in. Uh, I can't play it worth a lick. Uh, more so than Overwatch and Call of Duty. I can at least play those games and hold my own. League of Legends is completely foreign to me, but I do really enjoy watching uh, their streams. I do enjoy watching the competitions um, just because there's, it, the, the, the talent that these teams have is out of this world, um, and I'm very much looking forward to these worlds. So how that's the basic gist of the game. That's the basic rules, and it's very basic. There are all kinds of terms that I'm not throwing around, uh, like ganking. Ganking is where the person in charge of the jungle sneaks into one of the lanes and tries to take out the opponent, uh, one of the opponents in that lane. That's what ganking is. Um, there are other, ha- uh, harassing is another one, and yeah, there's all kinds of terminology. There's an entire Wikipedia, not page, an entire Wikipedia dedicated to League of Legends and all of its different rules. Um, That's LOL, League of Legends.gamepedia.com. There's even a tab called New to League, where it teaches you all the basics of League of Legends. It's a fantastic resource if you're thinking about watching these World Championships coming up soon. So let's talk about Worlds 2020. The structure is very simple. So like I said, 24 teams are invited, and they are grouped into um, two different stages. So the first is the play-in stage. There are teams in the play-in that play a mini tournament. Um, first is the um, the group stage. So 10 teams participate in the group stage. They're drawn into two groups based on their seating. They do a single round robin. Matches are best of one. And the top team from each of those two groups advances to the main event. The rest of the teams, or second, second, third, and fourth from uh, each group, excuse me, go to the knockout stage, and then the f- last team in each group of round one of the play-in goes home. So after round one, the group stage, the bottom two are gone. Second, third, and fourth of each group go to the next stage. The top team in each stage move on into the play into the uh, main event. Then we have the knockout stage, round two. The third place team from the group face the fourth uh, place team from the same group. And then the winners of those matches face the second place team from the opposite group. And then the winners of those final matches advance to the main event. So it's like a little mini tournament that goes on. But we end up with two winners instead of just one. Um, These matches are best of five, not best of one. So they're a little bit longer. And this decides the final teams in the main event. And the main event is a 16-team group stage, four groups of four, based on seeding. This is a double round robin, so they play every team twice in best-of-one matches. And just like FIFA Soccer at the World Cup, the top two teams from each group advance to the knockout stage. So... The main event starts to look like a FIFA format, a World Cup format that we're used to, or an Olympic soccer format that we're used to. And then the knockout stage is a single elimination bracket drawn randomly. First place teams play always face second place teams, so it's always 1v2 from the four, air, from the four uh, groups, and no two teams can be placed in the same half of the bracket. So number one in group one will be on one side of the bracket. Number two from group one will always be on the other side. And that's how the bracket is made. And it's single elimination, best of five until we have a champion. And then that champion goes on to glory and fame, the likes of which you've never seen. And what I mean by that is the winning team last year for League of Legends took home what was it? 2.2 million dollars, I believe was the top prize of League of Legends World Championship last year. Uh that is a hefty fee. Uh that's a hefty uh number for five players to split. That's not a bad payday. 2.2 million dollars across five people. Um pretty jealous actually. I would like 
some of that money. Uh, but I will never be that good. Uh, the prize pool for this year is actually a little bit higher, uh, $2.5 million. Um, that gets split among all the different teams. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is actually, uh, you probably have, there's a chance you've never even heard of League of Legends, which is fine. I mean, I, I, that makes sense. However, it is one of the largest esports in the world. The amount of people that watched the 2019 World Championships on Twitch is astounding. 100 million viewers across all platforms. 21.8 million average minute audience. So on average, 21.8 million people were watching every single minute. Their peak concurrent, the most people on the stream at one time, 44 million people are watching the World Championship Finals for League of Legends. That is so far ahead of every other game out there, it's really hard to describe. Think about it. Call of Duty, last uh, two weekends ago, Call of Duty League was bragging that they brought in 330,000 viewers for the grand finals between the Dallas Empire and the Atlanta phase. And League of Legends is out here with 44 million concurrent with 21 average per minute. That's what we're talking about here. Those kind of numbers and that kind of advertising money being made means that if you're into esports at all, this is absolutely something you should be paying attention to. If you want to be a fringe person, not really know the ins and outs of the game, but still watch a competitive esport, League of Legends is for you. If you want to get if you want to dig deep into it and learn every aspect of the game, you can do that too. There are teams all over the world to follow. There are teams all across the country to follow. And there's really a team for just about everyone. So, for example, let's talk about the teams that qualified for the main event group stage already. Three in China. Um, One is called the Top Esports. One is called JD Gaming. One is called Sunning. Uh, The European teams are G2 Esports, Fnatic, and Rogue. The Korean teams are Damn One Gaming, DRX, and Gen G. The North American teams are Team Solo Mid, FlyQuest, and Machi Esports. And then from the play inside, we have the Chinese LDG Gaming, the European team Mad Lions, the North American team Team Liquid, uh, PCS, P- PSG Talon, uh, Brazilian team INTZ, team called Unicorns of Love. That's a great name. I don't, where, I don't know where they're from, but that is a fantastic name. V3 Esports from Japan, R7, Rainbow 7 from Latin America, Legacy Esports from Oceania, and Papara Supermassive from Turkey. Now, there are a ton of teams to, to list there, but a very interesting thing is that none of those teams that I just mentioned are the defending champions from last year. Fun Plus Phoenix, a uh, Chinese team, was the champion from last year, and they're not even there. So we are guaranteed a brand new League of Legends world champion. There's no better time to get into League of Legends than right now. I highly suggest that you give it a shot uh, starting at the end of the month when the play-in stage begins. And you may find yourself downloading it and logging in just to see what all the fuss is all about. Um, It's definitely one to keep an eye on. Join the 44 million people at the peak and current uh, viewership that were enjoying it. And uh, maybe you'll learn a new game along the way. I can't recommend it enough. League of Legends looks like it's a lot of fun to watch. And uh, with 2020 Worlds coming up, it's only going to get more fun, folks. Um, Obviously, I'm cheering for the American team, Solo Mid, FlyQuest, and for Team Liquid to get out of the playing stage. But um, I'm really looking forward to a great World Championships this year. Uh, let's go. Let's do this, League of Legends. Let's do this. And now, 
Unlike the last couple of weeks where it has been loaded with things, there's only two small indie games to whet your thirst this week. Get out those glasses. It's time for What's on Tap. Two major indie titles make their way to digital storefronts this week on tap. First is Spelunky 2, the sequel to the very popular uh, platforming roguelike cave diving adventure. Uh, Spelunky 1 really made a big way, big splash when it came out a couple of years ago. And now the second one will finally be bestowed upon us on the 15th, so this coming Tuesday. Also, welcome to Elk, a biographical adventurer set on an island like no other, where every character encounter has a story to tell. This game has a very interesting art style, very unique, black and white, but every character uh, is in color, plus a couple other key features. Definitely one to keep on your radar uh, if you have PC or Xbox One. Certainly one that uh, intrigues me uh, that I might take a look at as well. But really, that's it. A lull in September, and then we get right back into it next week with some big titles. So, Spelunky 2, welcome to Elk. What's on tap for you? Yep, there they are, two indie titles for your gaming pleasure this week on tap. Um, Very good games, at least they look that way. Spelunky is awesome. Spelunky, I keep saying that weird. Spelunky, Spelunky, Spelunker, Spelunky. It's a fun game, it's fun to say. Um... Definitely one if you like platformers like Mario, but you like a little bit of challenge. Uh, Spelunky 2, I imagine, will be just the same. Um, and Welcome to Elk is different. Nice narrative adventure. I like games like that. And it's coming to Xbox, which uh, which helps. Uh, PC gaming is fun and all, but every once in a while I just want to hold a controller and play that way. And speaking of Xbox, that leads us into our second main topic of the evening That is Xbox breaking their silence in a way that they didn't want to, but they still broke their silence, and we now know all of the details for the upcoming launch of their next generation consoles. And boy howdy, is it a lot to talk about. So, Monday night, uh, just about going to bed, about midnight our time, a gentleman comes out with a video uh, explaining how he has information on the Xbox Series X. S. This was one that was heavily rumored to be a more affordable version of the new console, uh, but one that we had not seen or even had been confirmed by Microsoft yet. This video comes out, he's got a picture, he's got a small clip of what looks to be a Microsoft produced video introducing it. Very convincing stuff that this gentleman has. Brad Sams is his name. And about an hour later, Microsoft or the Xbox, the official Xbox Twitter, who, by the way, uh, how they handled this should be a case study in college courses uh, for social media management because they handled it expertly. Uh, When the cat was out of the bag, they just leaned in uh, with a bunch of memes, did a little bit bit of confirmation, which we'll get to, and then from that, all week long has just been stellar. Whoever's on that social media team, every pat on the back to you. Uh, You handled this perfectly. But anyway... But an hour after this video comes out, they follow it with a picture of the Shifty Eyes monkey puppet. Just uh, looking around like, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, that sort of thing. Very funny response. And then, two hours later, 3.17 a.m. Eastern Time, the Xbox Series S was confirmed. Two ninety nine launching November 10th. You'll get more news later. Cut to Wednesday. We got that news. So the Xbox Series S is $299. The Xbox Series X, which we've known about since December, is $499. Both of them launching on November the 10th. Now, they are basically, they're very similar in architecture, despite the $200 difference. Uh, The Xbox Series S has a smaller internal hard drive, 512 gig solid state drive, instead of a one tera, uh, one terabyte. And their uh, graphics output, or their processing output, is a little bit slower than the Xbox Series X. So that's where you're, lo- you're losing some processing power, you're losing some hard drive space, but and you're also losing native 4K resolution. It can upscale to 4K, but it cannot do native 4K resolution. 
otherwise, they're very similar in what they can do. They have HDMI 2.1. They can get up to 120 uh, frames per second if your TV uh, supports it. They can do direct X ray tracing. It can do variable rate shading. Uh, it can do spatial sound, Dolby Atmos, Dolby Vision for media apps like Disney+. Plus. It can do all this crazy stuff. Uh, despite only being $299 out of the box. That is insane and a value that I did not expect from uh, Xbox. I really did not. And the Xbox Series X, which is their most powerful console they have ever made, um, coming out at $499, which is about where I expected it. I didn't expect it to go any higher than that because they are focusing on the services that they provide, the Xbox Game Pass and stuff like that. So if $499 is a loss, they're making it up in Xbox Game Pass. And more importantly, they're going to make it up in this new um, format, that they not new format, but an expanded format that they have introduced called Xbox All Access. Now, if you're a parent of a gamer, this part is important. I want you to pay attention to this. So Xbox All Access will allow you to purchase the console at multiple retailers. So Walmart, GameStop, Best Buy, Target, and the Microsoft Store themselves, either online or in person, will give you will give you access, if you wish, to the Xbox All Access format. What this is, with Xbox All Access, it is the next generation Xbox console of your choice, so Series S or Series X, whichever you want, 24 months of Xbox Game Pass Ultimate, which is 100 games to play on console right out of the box, including um, games that are optimized for the next gen. 100 games to play on PC, if you have a PC as well. 100 games to play from the cloud, if you have an Android phone, you can be part of Project X Cloud. And, for the first time ever, an EA Play membership, which gives you access to 60 of EA's best console and PC games. All of that, with no upfront costs, for either... $34.99 a month for 24 months with the Series X, or $24.99 a month with no upfront costs for the Series S. Meaning that if you're already a Xbox Game Pass subscriber at $14.99 a month, you could get the next generation of consoles for $10, or for the Series S, I should say, for $10 more a month or the Series X for $20 more a month. That is absurd value for what you're paying for it. Granted, it's another monthly bill, but it's one you were already paying just a little bit extra. Easy to budget for. Not to mention, if you do the math of what you'd be paying separately, if you say, for example, you buy the... Xbox Series X at $500 flat and then you're pay and then you do 14.99 a month for Xbox Game Pass. If you do that math, it's 180 a year. 10 months is 15 plus uh, 30 more for the extra 2 months of the year, 180 180 for a year, 360 for 2 years, 500 plus 360 is 860. Right? There's the math. 34 99 a month, so $35 multiplied by 24 months is, if I could just do the quick math, if you'll hold on for me real quick, 840 You're saving $20 this way. Saving $20 on a brand new console. That is absurd. I have never seen value like this in a brand new console before, with all that it offers you right out of the gate. Not to mention, the Game Pass always adds new games, and every time a first-party Xbox uh, developer releases a brand new game, you get it day one, no questions asked. New Fable, whenever that launches, it's yours day one with Game Pass. 
New Halo, day one with Game Pass. Gears 6, whenever that happens, day one with Game Pass. Gears Tactics, which has been uh, confirmed to be being ported to the Xbox Series X as a launch title, day one, no questions asked. That's amazing. No matter which console you choose, you get all that. Now, the, the difficulty for either console is going to be managing the uh, memory card, the memory, because uh, 512 gigs only goes so far, as does only one Terra. Uh, I have two Terra, uh, three Terra combined in my Xbox uh, One X and two Terra uh, external hard drive right now, and I am finding myself having to delete games a lot. So there will be some management. You will not be downloading all 100 Xbox Game Pass games at one time. That's absurd. But it's still a little bit of uh, memory management. Uh, that, uh, that slight annoyance does not outweigh everything else that you've heard already. I am, I, for the first time, I am actually leaning towards the all-access for the Series X and paying the thirty four ninety nine a month, twenty dollars more than what I already pay right now for Xbox Game Pass. That makes sense to me. That is value that I cannot uh, really replace. I mean, I can't. I can't find the negative in it. There may be one uh, that comes out later on. There may be something they're not telling us. That's what always happens. Um. I'm hoping that they don't have a Red Ring of Death scenario where consoles just stop, you know, working. That would be terrible. But thirty four ninety nine a month for the brand new console, which is yours to own afterwards, and then all those games on console right at the start, all the EA Play stuff, all the PC stuff, it just makes all the sense in the world to me. Sony PlayStation is going to have to pull a rabbit out of their hat to beat that value. Granted, the two consoles have a very different approach to this next generation. As I said before, Xbox is focusing on streaming and the services that they offer. Game Pass is their cash cow. They know this. They're leaning in on it. That makes sense. Sony is focusing on the hardware. They want they want, they know that PlayStation is the the market leader in the in the uh, console sector, they know they have the name recognition. They know they're going to sell gangbusters, and they have a better, at least right now, first party first party software offering. That loyalty from their fan base is going to be rewarded no matter what. However, new players, new people getting into gaming for the first time will be remiss if they see uh, to to avoid the 299 series S especially at 2499 a month and everything that offers if they see PlayStation 5 the normal one at 600 and the all digital one at 500 uh that is not a confirmed price that is uh speculation on my part I actually think it's going to be 500 and 400 I'm just taking into account that they may do this. They may do $599 and $499. Um, I would like them both to be the same price, but the all-digital have double the hard drive space. That makes more sense to me, but I'm not the one making the call here. Um, if I get two terabytes of solid-state drive in a PlayStation 5 uh, for $500 and I lose the ability to, to uh, buy physical copies, I'm okay with that, but... That's neither here nor there. We don't know what Sony is doing because Sony hasn't made any moves yet. Xbox, to be fair, wasn't planning on doing this till next week, which, fine. They're only a week early, but that still doesn't account for where PlayStation is. Where is PlayStation? The the focus is now on you, PlayStation 5, to tell us when we're going to be picking up your console, and how much money we're going to need for it. We are halfway home from my rant from last week. Halfway there. Xbox has come through. Granted, it wasn't on their own terms. It was a week earlier than planned, but they still came through. And now, it's up to Sony 
to make things right and get this console information out to us uh, as soon as possible. I had heard some rumblings from people here or there that they may be waiting as late as October, which is too late. And hopefully this will start a fire under them to maybe get some information next week or the week after and not wait that long. Um, Or if they hold steady, power to them. Um, But I think that would be a mistake. And meanwhile, you have Nintendo who finally has released a slate, or what they're releasing, finally has given us information for their slate of games for the year with the Mario um, All-Stars in September, Pikmin 3 Deluxe in October, and the Hyrule Warriors that I mentioned in the 6 and 60 Age of Calamity uh, in November. Decent slate of games there. Um, definitely won an interesting... Uh, strategy, not to mention Smash Brothers DLC, whenever that gets announced and stuff like that. There's stuff in there. We are now beginning to see the 2020 gaming holiday take shape. Uh, Later on, not quite yet, but later on, I plan on doing a massive uh, piece on this podcast for you, a holiday guide to let you know the top games, what to look for, how much they're going to cost you, so on and so forth. Uh, But that's neither here nor there. We still got a little bit of time before that happens. Um... But yeah, there you go. Xbox has given us the information. They have bestowed upon us that which we have wished to know. And now it's just a matter of S or X. And uh, if you're going to do the all-access payment plan, which I would uh, recommend, seems like a very good idea. But that's it. So uh, with that being said, it is now time to move on to the speed run. First topic on the speed run tonight is one that is near and dear to my heart. It's one that we talked about. I talked about with uh, John Jansen on the radio yesterday, Sean Brace being off for the week. And that is the 25th birthday, the 25th anniversary of the original PlayStation. Man, isn't that sound wonderful? It just brings back so many good, good memories of summers and and Christmas breaks and the occasional sick day where I would just sit and play to my heart's content. Just all kinds of different games come to mind. Some were classics that are highly regarded as some of the best games ever. Some were just good to me. Uh, games that I love to play, uh, even though they were objectively not very good. Um, and I want to talk about a couple of my favorites right here, right now. Uh, let's do five games that may or may not have been on your radar back in the original PlayStation days, but should be now. Um, even if you can, if you can get your hands on a PlayStation Classic and you know, modify it to put whatever game you want on there, play them that way. If you want to eBay an original PlayStation and get the discs that way, so long as they're, you know, within your financial means, sometimes original PS1 games can be uh, pretty damn expensive, to be completely honest with you. Um, All of these games are worth it. All of these games are ones that you should, should look into. Um... And I promise it just won't be a bunch of fighting games. There will be one or two in there. Um, I'll also, now that I've said five, I may go more than that. I can't promise anything. I could play talk about the original PlayStation all stinking day. So let's start with um, a new approach to a classic character. Uh, and that is Mega Man Legends. Mega Man Legends took Mega Man and put him in a 3D adventure Um, full range of motion in these big 3D worlds, no longer just side-scrolling, going from left to right. This game is excellent. Uh, Very good story, told very, very well. The sequel was just as good, although that ends on a cliffhanger, and we haven't seen Legends 3 since. It's a sore spot to Mega Man fans. I wouldn't suggest bringing it up to them. Uh, But the original Mega Man Legends is an absolute classic. I recently had the chance to replay it on the PlayStation Vita, uh, with their PlayStation 1 ability, with, a, with that console's PlayStation 1 ability, um, and absolutely loved it. I would love to play it again 
uh, somehow, just to refresh my memory on how great this game is. Um, definitely one for your attention, especially if you like Mega Man and kind of fell out. Uh, that would be a PlayStation 1 game that I would recommend uh, looking for in the future. Um, first fighting game of our little countdown is maybe the best Street Fighter ever made for a console as far as accuracy to the uh, arcade experience, at least on PlayStation. And that is Street Fighter Alpha 3. Street Fighter Alpha 3 was the pinnacle of PlayStation Street Fighter for me. It had a roster that was huge and deep. It had multiple ways to play the game between the World Tour where you unlock more characters or the normal arcade modes, dramatic battle where two players can fight against one boss at the same time. That was really, really cool. Um, Street Fighter Alpha 3 is the one if you want to play PlayStation Street Fighter without a shadow of a doubt. I know I'm not alone in that. Um, that is the one to get. Um, let's talk also about someone who's coming back this October, uh, one of the biggest mascots in PlayStation history, and that's Crash Bandicoot. My favorite Crash Bandicoot is Crash Bandicoot 2, Gore-Tex Strikes Back. One is good, three is also very good, but two really hit that sweet spot for me. Uh, big fan of that game. I uh, loved playing it with my little sister back in the day. Uh, she would watch me play. It came out while she was like two or three, but eventually she grew into it and played with me. Uh, that was a nice brother-sister bonding, Crash Bandicoot 2. Um, love the stages, love the, the, like, the different collectibles to get, love the story, love Neo Cortex's voice, one of the best voices on the PlayStation, rivaled only by the game we're going to talk about next. And that is definitely one to play either this way or via the Crash, um, the recently restored Insane Trilogy, or remastered, remade Insane Trilogy, which is out now on PlayStation 4. Play it that way, but uh, Crash 2 is a classic, no matter how you slice it. But if we're going to talk about voices, or voice actors in PlayStation, I would like to make special mention of Twisted Metal 2. Specifically Twisted Metal 2. 1 was a good, was a good way to start the franchise, 3 and 4 were a good way to drive it into the ground. Uh, it came back in PlayStation 2, but we're not talking about that. Twisted Metal 2 is pinnacle Twisted Metal. Even now, it's the peak of all of the Twisted Metal franchise. Uh, the gameplay is the best. The world tour stages are the best. The cars, the characters that you can choose are the best. And it's the best version of the overarching villain, uh, puppet master, whatever you want to call him, Calypso. That there is. That voice is so distinctive to me. Even now, I will go back and watch cutscenes from that game just to hear his trademark, I am Calypso, and I thank you for playing Twisted Metal. So just just vicious and, and oh, it's such a good, it's just a well done voice acting turn for whoever that was. Um, kudos to you should your ears ever lead you to this podcast I loved your voice acting scared the hell out of me as, as a kid uh, Twisted Metal 2 another one that should be on your radar and now from manic crazy car combat to slow and stealthy espionage let's talk about Metal Gear Solid shall we Metal Gear Solid uh, the Playstation 1 entry in the Metal Gear franchise, which before then had only seen entries on the original Nintendo and Game Boy. This was a huge resurgence for the franchise, and one that really revolutionized how these action games can be played. Solid Snake is an iconic character that started here. I mean, granted, he started in the original Metal Gear, but really came into his own here. This is another example of excellent voice acting, uh, especially in the PS1 days. Everyone in this game uh, was acted perfectly, uh, right from David Hayter as Solid Snake to Cam Clark as Liquid Snake, everybody in between, Debbie Mae West as Meryl, Silverball, everybody, everyone in this game was voiced perfectly. Um, Psycho Manus is up there as one of the creepiest characters of all time, thanks to this game. Um, that is, This is one I try to play once a year, or go back to once a year, um, 
just to run through it again. The Twin Snakes on the GameCube is also good, uh, taking the Metal Gear Solid 1 story and putting it in the Metal Gear Solid 2 graphical style, but you can't beat the original. You just can't beat the original Metal Gear Solid. Uh, it's a hell of a game, and one that I will always treasure uh, for the rest of my days. And then uh, we talked about this big time on the uh, on the radio with John Jansen. Final Fantasy really came into its own on the PlayStation between 7, 8, and 9. You can't go wrong with any of those three. The side game Tactics is another one that really was huge on the franchise, eight, uh, on the PlayStation. 8 is my favorite ever of the franchise. Um, again, probably because it's the first one I ever played. But uh, 7 and 9 are also very, very good. Tactics, also very, very good. Um, that is a franchise that cannot be beat, even to this day, if you want great Japanese turn-based RPG action. Uh, the remake of Final Fantasy VII kind of goes away from that. Goes to a more of an action RPG stance, a la Kingdom Hearts or something like that. But it works for the current, the current day. Having things turn-based back in the day, the system was amazing for RPGs, and it'll never get better than that. If we're talking about lesser-known games, or games that kind of flew under the radar, we could talk about Alundra, if you like RPGs. We can talk about uh, Battle Arena Toshinden, that trilogy, if you like uh, fighting games, Bloody Roar as well. Um, Croc Legend of the Gabos is a bit of a joke, but if you want a cutesy, simple platformer with a bit of an edge, uh, Croc Legend of the Gabos, I highly, highly, highly remember renting that from Video Update, the blockbuster-esque store uh, near me in suburban Philadelphia, and trying to beat that game multiple times, uh, Croc Legend of the Gabos. And somewhere, the creator of that game is smiling, and he has no idea why. Uh, the Gex trilogy, uh, the Gex 1, which is a side-scrolling platformer, and then Gex 2, Enter the Gecko, and 3, Deep Cover Gecko, which became more of a thir- uh, uh, 3D uh, platformer a la Super Mario 64. Those were good games. Guilty Gear got its start on the original PlayStation. I could go on and on and on. Uh, Jet Moto, I can't believe I almost forgot Jet Moto. I loved those games uh, growing up as a kid. Uh, Jet Moto 2 was one of the first games I ever owned uh, on the system. Uh, and and the list goes, Resident Evil. I didn't even talk about Resident Evil. Resident Evil 1, 2, and 3. The franchise started on this console, and I'm just getting to it now, as if it's an afterthought. What the heck is wrong with me? But PlayStation 1, happy 25th anniversary. You are... Uh, one of the best consoles ever made, and I really enjoyed playing you, and I hope that maybe someday you can have another resurgence. Maybe the PlayStation 5 will surprise us and be completely backwards compatible. I don't expect it to, um, but maybe it's a thing, and uh, I'll be able to play some great PlayStation 1 games again soon. Uh, So happy 25th to the PlayStation. It was also the 21st birthday of the Dreamcast, but outside of some fighting games and some Sonic games, um, not not ready to go into that one yet. Uh, But happy 21st birthday to the Sega Dreamcast as well. So that's topic number one of the speed run. Let's talk about topic number two. And this one is near and dear to my heart, uh, and it's something that I'm going to have to ask my listenership to help me with. So, there is a charity out there called Extra Life. Extra Life, the tagline is Play Games, Heal Kids. Uh, This was started uh, uh, back in 2008 and has raised over $70 million uh, in U.S. dollars for sick and injured kids across the entire Children's Miracle Network of Hospitals. Uh, It's big game day this year is November the 7th. You can create your own, but if you're participating in the actual game day, it's November 7th of 2020, and it is a 24-hour gaming marathon where I will play video games from 8 a.m. to 8 a.m. in order to raise money for the hospital of my choice in the Children's Miracle Network of Hospitals. This year... Or, I'm sorry, the uh, miracle, the, the hospital of my choice is Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, shop, 
right over there on, uh, on Penn's campus. That is the one I will be playing for. Uh, this is the seventh year that I've done it. Uh, I actually skipped a year, a couple years, due to having children and just not being able to, uh, to get into it as I did before. Um, I have personally raised already uh, $335. My goal is $1,226. So that's where you, my listener, come in to play. Uh, my goal is twelve twenty six, which is one dollar more than I have ever made. And my, my record in this event was two thousand and sixteen. I raised twelve hundred and twenty five dollars uh, in one session, in one year, uh, from about August until the game day in November, and a couple that came in after that. Um, twenty seventeen, I raised nine fifty, and then I haven't done it since. So I'm I'm back after two years of being away. And here's my deal. If I can get to $1,226 by that November 7th game day, I agree to play one of the scariest games out there right now in Resident Evil 7, and I will play it in VR, and I will stream it all on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash jfan64. I do not do horror games well. I'm not sure if you are aware of this. Um, I'm the kind of guy who will play a horror game by watching a little bit on YouTube and then getting past that part on uh, in my actual playthrough, just because jump scares and I don't get along. I guarantee at least an hour of me playing this game on stream. It'll be the longest hour and whatever it ends up being in my life, but I will do it for this charity. Because raising this money for CHOP is important to me. Um, My wife and I have both been very blessed to have two healthy, happy kids so far. Knock on wood. Uh, But when we have needed a hospital, when we have needed a doctor, CHOP has been there for us. And we haven't had to call on them often. Again, knock on wood. But when we've had to, they've been there. They've been great. They've been helpful. And they have guided us through whatever we whatever trial we were going through with our children at that time. And we're the easy ones. Like we are we're the ones that don't have a lot of issues. So it's equally important to me to get this money to chop so that they can help people who need them more than I do. Or that we than my wife and I do, than my kids do. Because there are kids who basically live in chop because of whatever ailment they have and it breaks my heart i'm not gonna lie that kind of thing breaks my heart and if i can do just a little bit just a little bit of something to help a child in that hospital get the treatment they need or god forbid get better and get out of there i feel like it's something i have to do to pay it forward for everything that they've done for my family and my kids um in the in the four years that I've been a father. So November 7th, I will be playing games for charity. I'll release a schedule of what I'm going to play. Um, I'll need all the support I can get, uh, both financially and in the stream, uh, when it comes to, you know, like the late hours, the wee hours. Uh, 3 a.m. Uh, Fall Guys is going to be interesting. I imagine I'm going to be jumping off the sides a lot. I may even fall asleep on stream. We'll see what happens. But... Um, you can go to my page at www.extra-life.org slash participant slash Jason dash Fidelli uh, to donate to my cause. All of the money goes to CHOP. I don't see a cent of it. It's not like it gets passed to me and then passed to them. It's completely on them. I am just the one playing the games for charity. If you could donate to this cause, I would be forever grateful. Uh, 1226 gets me playing uh, Resident Evil 7 in VR. A grown man may cry on Twitch. We'll see. Um, But I would really, I really love doing it. It's my seventh year, like I said. Haven't done it since 2017. And I really want to raise a good amount of money uh, for Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. 
So that's extra-life.org slash participant slash Jason Finelli, station dash Finelli. I will put that information in the um, notes of this episode so you can get it right there uh, on your iHeartRadio app or on iHeartRadio.com. Uh, and yeah, I would really appreciate it if you could do that for me. Uh, I will remind again uh, as the weeks go on. Uh, it's not till November the 7th, so we got about two months of fundraising to do uh, before the time is up. Um, and I would really like to get this done if I could. So with that plea, uh, we have reached the end of episode number 13 of the Cheese Steaks and Controllers podcast. I hope you learned something today, whether it be about League of Legends or the new Xboxes or PlayStation's 25th birthday or Extra Life, a fantastic charity. Um, I look forward to coming into your ears again next week with more big-time gaming news and esports commentary. Um, looking forward to Overwatch League this weekend, see what the Fusion can do. League of Legends is coming up as well, as we talked about earlier. A lot to like right now in the video game world. Um, just depends on where you want to put your attention. So, with that, I am esports and gaming insider Jason Finelli. This has been the Cheese Steaks and Controllers podcast for Fox PHL The Gambler, 1025 FM Philadelphia, 1480 AM Philadelphia. For me and for the entire Cheese Steaks and Controllers team, aka me again, thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you next week. Goodbye. Good.